last while as we try and figure out uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic overall. First of all, Ray Watt, thanks again for joining us uh, today. Would very much like your thoughts on our numbers. We have seen these numbers drop and drop and drop, and especially considering that our test positivity rate was cl- was close to 15% at uh, one point a couple months ago. So overall, this is good news, uh, but would certainly like to hear your thoughts in terms of this, because honestly, it's uh, right now it's kind of tough to try and find some negatives here. <laughs> yeah, and you shouldn't find some negatives because celebrate the good news when it comes, because you guys have been through some uh, some bad times. Yeah, it looks like the wave is coming to an end in Manitoba as it has in other parts of the country. The one statistic that gives me a little pause, though, is the test positivity rate. It's come down remarkably. Still a bit too high for my reckoning. I would like that to be under 1%, but 4% is not bad considering where you were. And 4% suggests two things. It suggests maybe not testing enough, and maybe there's more penetration of the disease that you you know about. Um, But all things look good. Uh, However, a word of caution is always... Uh, appropriate here when we talk about the presence of the Delta variant, which is making its way across North America. So that means we have to not let up on pressure to get two doses into as many people as possible. Some of the numbers that were released by our top doctor yesterday focused on the number of admissions into hospital in the month of June, and it was around 412 people. And a vast majority of those admissions had no dose of vaccine. Some had one dose, but were within that 14 days, so really weren't seeing the benefit of it. And I I don't believe there were any uh, fully vaccinated people that were admitted. Is this the proof that some people need to see the, that the hard numbers to say, listen, vaccines work? You would think so, right? But at this point, I'm not sure what kind of evidence some people need. But yeah, the USA has been saying this for a while. 99, 95% of their cases are in the unvaccinated population. In epidemiology, we think of the susceptible population. And so long as a large number of susceptible people remain, the disease has a foothold. And we remove people from the susceptible group in one of several ways. First is if you die, which is not good. Second is if you get COVID and recover and get immunity that way. And third is if you get vaccinated. So bit by bit, we're removing the size of that susceptible population. And when we get it down to a certain level, the disease can't find a home anymore. We call that herd immunity. So the fact that we're seeing um, the majority, if not the entirety, of serious cases in the unvaccinated population tells us strongly that vaccination works to keep people out of the hospital. It won't always work to keep people from getting infected, but it looks like it's almost always going to work to keep people out of the hospital and out of the morgue. So when we consider this, Ray Watt, and we look at, you know, our additional COVID numbers, again, the test positivity rate, the hospitalizations, that sort of thing. So when we factor all this in, when it comes to reopening, We obviously can't keep the same stringent uh, restrictions in place forever. I mean, people need to eventually, you know, get out and and do things. But what should, uh, from your perspective, officials be considering as we look at loosening restrictions? Are are there some areas that are still no-go areas despite all the the good news? Yeah, it's a good question, a difficult question, because we treat this disease when we look at the metrics for reopening as if it's homogeneously distributed across the population, and it's not. It's punctuated in some areas more than others. Vaccine distribution is not the same across the board. Some hospitals are more fun, uh, more filled than others. So the first thing I look at, of course, is the epidemiological indicators. How present is the, is the disease? Second, I look at the population indicators. How much vaccination and immunity is there in the population? And third is the health systems indicators. How much space is there in the hospitals in case things go sour? And reopening the economy is a lot about the hospital capacity because you can't do things like have uh, movies being filmed where you live in case the stuntmen get injured and need to go to the hospital. It's got to be bed space for them. But all that has to be contextualized within the larger discussion of the Delta variant, which is hypertransmissible, which means the threshold for herd immunity is now higher than we thought it would be a few months ago. That means we're unlikely to get to herd immunity this year, frankly, unless like all the children get vaccinated. So with that being said, It means that as things open up, we're going to have to keep some mitigation tools in place, like strategic mask wearing and strategic limitations on gathering. So people should not expect the gates to be thrown open one day and everything to be back to normal. It's going to be a staged process 
with some tools lingering for months longer. As you have done these interviews uh, since we first discovered you, uh, <laughs> a young epidemiologist uh, toiling away at the University of Ottawa, you, you've gone on to do interviews not just in Canada but around the world. But when you look at Canada, would you prefer that all of the loosening or all of the restrictions or all the plans be looked at as as one plan for Canada, or is it better to have the different provinces doing different things? Because I think it's hard for people, if you're sitting in Manitoba going, hey, but over there in Saskatchewan and over there in Alberta, they're not wearing masks. They're not staying out of people's homes. They're going to, you know, the Calgary stampede and all of these things. So would it be easier from where you sit to have Mm -hmm. one plan for one country? It would be easier, but is that the appropriate political, social, and public health thing to do? And this is what I mean by that. Politically, of course, we have a a federal-provincial divide that has responsibilities for healthcare. Um, Socially, uh, people might not be tolerant of a diversified approach, as you noticed, as you noted, rather. Public health-wise, though, it's more complicated because we live in a huge country, and the situation is different in every province, different region of that province. It's different in terms of the number of people with two doses. It's different in terms of the geography, the built environment, about how the disease can spread, the culture of the people living there. Do they live in high-rise tenements or in large farms and ranches where they're unlikely to um, come in contact with people? And also, they're different in terms of where certain variants are spreading. In Ontario, for example, we have a really big problem with the Delta variant, which is now quite dominant, and that's going to define our reopening strategy. Other provinces and and territories don't have that, and they can be a bit more lax. So it it pretty much has to be a regional approach. What I would like to see at the federal level is a grander guiding principle, and we kind of have that. Um, Sort of like look at these sets of indicators and think about them in this way, and hopefully the provinces are following that roadmap, and it looks to me like they mostly are. But... Uh, It is disconcerting when we see regional approaches accessing and interpreting the science in different ways. That's the part I can't really understand. For example, some places are less amenable to the idea that COVID is airborne than others. COVID is airborne, and I think we all need to accept that, which means we need to accept high-quality masks, good ventilation in schools, and things like that. It's a long answer to a simple question. The easy answer is, I think regional is the way to go. So ultimately, Ray Watt... You know, and I think a lot of us are looking forward to these loosened restrictions that are being announced tomorrow here in Manitoba. But considering our circumstances, are there uh, what would you ultimately like to see from provincial health officials uh, in terms of maybe some areas where they don't quite loosen rules just yet? Right. So there are essentially four things I want to see in every province as we harden ourselves against the Delta variant to prevent a fourth wave. Number one is get more first and second doses into people. Number two is shorten the time, the interdose interval between the first and second dose. Number three is prioritize those doses for essential workers and in hot zone areas in your province. And the last thing is resist the temptation to open up earlier than your plan indicated simply because you're noticing cases are falling faster. It's better to err on the side of conservatism. right? So, But when it comes to the kinds of things I want to see in a given province, in addition to those things, I think we got to focus on safe September, making sure that schools are ready to go in a safe manner because kids under 12 still cannot get vaccinated. And that's going to be the single largest susceptible block, therefore, where I expect to see most outbreaks. And if we can wrap public health assets around schools, we have a very good chance of making uh, the fall and winter very comfortable indeed. So uh, there are things we can do, and I think we have the tools and the political will to do them. Oh, I think we may well, have... Oh, no, there's no, Julie. No, no. Just, give, <laughs> just give me a second there, buddy. Uh, thanks, Ray Watt. We will no doubt talk to you uh, in the days ahead as we get set to uh, see what loosened restrictions we get tomorrow after meeting those vaccination targets well ahead of schedule. Thanks for popping on and, and joining us this afternoon, as you always do. My pleasure. Just ahead... 